Bismillah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. You're listening to microbiology lesson on microscopy. This is part two of the lecture. In part one, we looked at key historical figures in microscopy and some basic optical principles that scientists use to invent microscopes. In this episode, we're going to talk about the general types of those inventions. I'll talk about the light microscopes first. If there is one type of microscope that majority of people would know about, microbiologists or not, that would be the compound light microscope. It's widely used in education and research, so as a microbiology student, it will be good for you to know the components of a compound light microscope by heart. It will be awkward if you don't. It'd be like a computer science student who doesn't know the difference between CPU and GPU. The way I like to describe the components of the light microscope is by following the, the light path. So the light source is placed at the base of the microscope. Another name for it is the illuminator. This light will go upward through a condenser. The condenser gathers light and directs it to the specimen. The condenser has an aperture lever. This is also called the iris diaphragm. Iris is a good name because it helps us remember what it does. Iris diaphragm on a microscope is like the iris in our eyes. The iris in our eyes controls how much light comes through our pupil into our retina. So the iris of the microscope controls the amount of light coming through the condenser into the stage. The stage is above the condenser. In the middle of it is an opening. So light from the condenser goes through there. You put your specimen slide on this stage and you use the slide holder to keep it in position. So the light goes up from the illuminator to the condenser to the stage where your specimen is. This light then goes into the objective lens. I'll expand the objective lenses in a minute. So light from the objective lens will go to the ocular lenses. You can call this part the eyepiece because the word ocular means the eyes from Latin oculus. When you hear oculus, it usually has something to do with our eyes. Like oculus repero is the spell that Hermione uses to fix Harry's glasses. Oculus VR is the brand that Facebook acquired for $2 billion or something. They are grabbing that future market segments for virtual reality. So that has to do with our visuals. So here, you won't mix up between the ocular and the objective lenses if you remember that word. Now, the objective lens. You typically have four objective lenses on your microscope. To correct the viewing focus, you adjust the distance between the objective lens and the stage. You do this by using two knobs. These two knobs are at the sides of your microscope. There is the coarse adjustment knob, which you use to make major reposition. You then can fine tune the focusing using the smaller knob. It's called the fine adjustment knob. So you play around with this until you get a sharp focus. Those objective lenses, they've got colored bands on them. Red, yellow, blue, and white. They have optical specs carved at the side of the lens tube as well, like the value for numerical aperture, which I talked about in part one of this lecture, and also the magnification value of that lens. So the red lens has 4x on it. What it means is that the lens magnifies your specimen four times. The yellow band lens is 10x. The blue is 40x. The white is 100x. You want to know this value because you need it to calculate your total magnification power. To get your total magnification power, you multiply the value for objective lens with that of the ocular lens. The ocular lens is usually 10x, but I think they sell other magnifications as well. So check that before you calculate it. So let's say your objective is 4x and your ocular is 10x, then you need to report your magnification 
as 4 times 10, which is 40x. When your objective is 100x and your ocular is 10x, your total magnification is 1000x. By the way, when you use the 100x objective lens, you put immersion oil on your glass slip on top of your specimen. We do this to compensate for the refraction. If you're not sure what refraction means, go back to part one of this lecture. I mention it in there along with other optical principles. All right, one last note. Depending on the microscope model that your lab has, you might see other colors like green band or brown band lenses. Even the red band lens, depending on the microscope model, some of them may have 3x or 5x on them instead of the 4x magnification that I mentioned here. So the smart thing to do is when you use a new microscope for the first time, look at the magnification value of the lens. Now, the compound microscope doesn't work for all samples, especially when you're looking for more advanced structural observations. So for the rest of this audio, I'll talk about different optical microscopes that have been invented. It's going to feel dry a bit because I'll go through one microscope, then another, then another. So you need to summon some willpower to stay focused and to listen to this recording again and again to learn them. You might not experience the benefit of this immediately, except that I suppose it helps you score in your exam. But like I've always said, I don't teach you for the exams. I teach you to prep you for your potential future and to make you a better thinker. So by learning the different types of microscopes, it speeds up your thinking. Your, you, you comprehend, it speeds up your comprehension when you read scientific articles that involve microscopic observations. So instead of reading a scientific paper and think to yourself, what's going on here? All these weird names and figures. You'd be like, oh, that weird name is just the fluorochrome that the scientists use to tag the cytokine because they're using fluorescence microscope. I learned that one before. So I want to help you get there so that you'll be ahead in your learning than your friends who ignore lessons from classes like this. I promise I'll keep it super short and as simple as possible. And I'm going to just give you the basic principles. All right, here we go. So the first one is what's called dark field microscopy. We use dark field microscopes for microorganisms that are very see-through, that when you use the compound light microscope, you don't get enough contrast between the microbe and its background. In a dark field microscope, you put a patch stop in between the light source and the condenser. The patch stop is a round disc, like, like a coin that partially blocks the light at its middle. The only light waves that will reach the condenser then are the ones at the outer ring. Then the condenser will direct the light to the specimen on the stage. Two things will happen to the light. Firstly, some light waves will transmit through. I talk about light transmission in part one of this lecture. Basically, the light waves go in a straight line. This transmitted light will be blocked. It doesn't get to the objective lens. Secondly, some other light waves that go through the specimen, they will scatter. They, they go at multiple angles, multiple directions. This scattered light is not blocked. The scattered light gets to the objective lens and then get transmitted to the camera. What you will see then is a dark background because the transmitted light was blocked and you, you, you're going to see your sample glow because of the received scattered light. So that's the dark field microscope. The second type is phase contrast microscopy. With this one, we put an annulus between the light source and the condenser. An annulus is like a disc with an opening that shapes like a ring. It blocks some of the light at its middle and it allows the rest of the light to go through that opening. 
the light that goes through the opening will shape like a ring if you view it from the condenser. So the condenser then directs the light to the specimen. Here, some light waves will maintain their direction. These are the background light. Some other light waves will be scattered by the specimen. Both the background light and the scattered light will reach the objective lens. The objective lens then will project the light to the image plane, to your camera. But on their way there, the light waves will pass through two rings, the phase shift ring and the gray filter ring. The phase shift ring will cause the constructive interference between the scattered light waves and the nearby background light waves. To make it simple for you, just think of it as the ring makes the scattered light overlap with the background light that are close to the specimen. When the light behaves that way, the specimen area becomes brighter. And then the gray filter ring will just dim the background light that are distal or far from the specimen. So to put it simply, the rings make the general background area of your image darker and the specimen area brighter. By doing this, the microscope improves the contrast that you need to see your sample clearly. That's the phase contrast microscope. Another type of microscopy is the DIC or Differential Interference Contrast Microscopy. You see, light waves refract differently when it goes through your specimen compared to when it goes through its surrounding. So DIC uses this difference in the way light travels. It uses it to create a contrast between the specimen and its surrounding. To do that, we first use a filter and a prism. We use them to do two things, to polarize the light and to split the light. Polarizing the light simply means we make the wave to travel in a in a certain geometric orientation. So normally, when there is a light coming to the condenser, they oscillate, they vibrate in all different orientations, you know, up and down, left to right, whatever. When we polarize the light, they only vibrate at a certain orientation. For example, only at 45 degrees or only at 90 degrees. So that's what the filter and prism do to the light. They polarize the light. The second thing that the prism does is it splits the light into two beams. These two beams of light have different polarization, different orientations. Then the condenser, as usual, will direct the two beams to the specimen. One beam will go through the specimen. The other will go through its surrounding. And both beams will reach the objective lens. After that, the objective lens will project the two beams to a second prism. The second prism puts the two beams together. It does it in a way that changes the amplitude, the, the way the two beams travel. These combined beams of light will then go through one more filter to remove some unwanted light, the direct transmission light. And then it reaches your camera and the image will be very well contrasted and almost three-dimensional. So that's your differential interference contrast microscopy. The next microscopic approach is the fluorescence microscopy. In fluorescence microscopy, you beam a short wavelength light to your specimen. For this, you use a filter and a mirror. The specimen will fluoresce which means it will change the wavelength and releases it back as a longer wavelength light. And as I mentioned in the previous audio, different wavelengths will show up as different colors. So you're going to get different colored images depending on its fluorescent properties. Some microorganisms fluoresce naturally, but most cells don't. So what we do then is we tag the cells or the components of the cells with fluorochromes. Fluorochromes are molecules that can fluoresce, that can show up as colors. A common way of doing this is 
by attaching the fluorochromes to an antibody and then bind that antibody to your sample. So that's fluorescence microscopy. Quite straightforward compared to what we have before. The last one we're going to talk about is the confocal microscopy. Confocal microscopy, in a way, is a derivation of the fluorescent microscopy techniques. Here, you also stain your sample with fluorochromes. Then you beam the light to your sample, usually a laser. So you beam this light through a tiny aperture, a tiny hole. The light beam will go through a mirror called a beam splitter and then through a lens. The lens then will direct the light to the focal point where you got your specimens. These specimens which have been tagged with fluorochromes will emit light back. And this emitted light will travel back through the lens and to the beam splitter mirror. Then the mirror will reflect the light to a light detector through a second aperture. So the reason we use these tiny apertures is to remove light that cause the images to be blurry. right? So the light detector will get a very sharp image. Now, in a confocal system, the laser beam is very narrow. So it just hit one tiny spot of your specimen at a time. So to get a full image of a specimen, the system has like a servo mechanism to move laser around, to move the mirror around so that it will shoot or take a photo of all different spots of your specimen. And then the computer will construct a full beautiful image from all those photo shots. So that's the confocal microscopy. All right, done. In the next audio, I'll talk about the electron microscopes. Anyway, if you can't follow the mechanistic principle of how each light microscope work, don't, don't beat yourself up. Just do your best. I won't give you like an essay exam question where you have to like elaborate the detailed optical theories or, or anything like that. You won't need that at this level. However, if you are interested to understand the principles more deeply, my advice would be for you to brush up on your physics a bit, especially on topics that are related to wave behaviors like phase shifting or, or wave diffusion. That will help you to better understand what I just taught you. Otherwise, you can focus on what's being mentioned in our reference textbook and you should be fine. Okay? All right. Keep learning. Talk to you later. Barakallahu li wa alaikum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.